And welcome everyone to the second presentation in the San Ramon Speaker Series. As you know, the purpose of this series is to allow both veteran and emerging leaders to have an exchange of views on important leadership issues. In the first presentation with Don Thompson, we listened to Don's perspectives on leadership issues in the oil sands industry, which is truly a critical component of Canada's economic stability and prosperity. But the question lingers, is leadership driven simply by economic indicators? In tonight's second presentation, we welcome Mr. Doug Williamson, a highly regarded business consultant, chief executive officer of the Beacon Group, and author of a new book called Straight Talk on Leadership, Solving Canada's Business Crisis. Prior to his current engagement, Doug lived and worked in the UK, Canada, and the United States, and served clients in Europe and, Nor and the Nordic countries, Mexico, Australia, and the Middle East. As well, Doug has held several senior executive level positions with the Royal Bank of Canada and within the Canadian government. Based on this full spectrum of experience, Doug perceives that Canadian business is falling further and further behind as the global economy takes its next big step. In Doug's view, Canada's false sense of accomplishment and complacency on one hand, and naivete and short-sightedness on the other, have contributed to a worrying deficit of ambition. Tonight, Doug will share his views on what specific mindsets and behaviors leaders require to be successful in reversing the current downward trend. As Peter mentioned, the format of tonight's presentation will be a 25 to 30 minute presentation followed by a Q&A. And as Peter mentioned, uh, you can, as questions occur to you, uh, jot them down in the Q&A box in the upper right hand corner and we'll address them in order or selectively, as Peter said, if time is limited. So without further ado, here is Doug Williamson for tonight's presentation. Doug, welcome to the San Ramon Speaker Series. Over to you. David, thank you, and uh, welcome to everyone else. Let me set the scene if I can. Uh, as David said, I want to talk about business leadership. And that means that we have to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And my objective is really to share some thoughts, perspectives from over 30 years of international experience and uh, maybe give you some things that, that rattle you a bit and, uh, and, and, and shake you up. I, um, I, I want to poke the bear. I, I want to be a little controversial if I can and debunk some of the myths that, that I believe are, are out there. And I want to, in that process, give you some brain food, uh, a perspective about how the role of leadership is changing, how it will continue to change going forward, and put all of that under the, the banner of the Canada brand and, and talk about the particular implications for Canada at, at the end of the day, uh, the shocks that we have seen, the economic shocks, the social shocks throughout the Middle East, uh, technological changes that we've seen, the pace of those changes is going to pick up speed. So no matter how disturbed the markets may seem to, to many uh, traditional or conventional thinkers, uh, the shock waves are yet to come, and I'm going to try to explain uh, why I believe that and happy to take any questions on it, but I want you to, to follow three strands that, that I'd like to weave through this story, and they're, they're linked to uh, leadership, followership, and human capital, and those three strands to me are the, uh, the essence of, of the way we need to reframe our thinking about leadership. So let me, let me start with the first strand and, and give you the, the, uh, the point that I'd like you to, to keep in mind. We'll come back to it, but I wanna, in essence, start at the end uh, rather than the front. In Canada, uh, we're a land of precious natural resource, but our scarcest natural resource is a good leadership. We just don't have enough of it in any part of the country and in any sector. Secondly, there are a new set of leadership competencies, uh, leadership abilities, capabilities, you can use a number of different words for it, but they are changing and most leaders today don't recognize that there is that new set of competencies. 
thirdly, I'm very concerned that business isn't playing a larger role in trying to grow leaders. And I think as we look out over the tapestry and look into uh, business students and, and across businesses, the rate of growth in the business community isn't there. We're not growing the leaders that we need. The second theme that I want to talk about in the next 25 minutes is followership. I think that people have not paid enough attention to the importance of followership. Followership is particularly important in the middle management ranks of an organization in the middle class, if you like, if you want to think of it in a, in a business community sense, that middle class, that middle management are the forgotten masses. Um, they are the ones in business that get constantly squeezed. They do not get the attention that they need. And because we don't have enough leaders with big, bold ambitions, it means that we end up with followers who have a deficit of ambition and we're not giving followers anything to, um, to kind of grasp onto. The third and last point that I want as an underline here is around human capital. And simply to say that if, if you think about the evolution of people in the workplace going back to the 1920s, there's been a forward progression in our thinking about people. We've shifted from thinking about people as, as costs to thinking about people as assets. And now we need to think about human capital in a much broader sense. And unfortunately, we don't have enough business leaders who understand the modern uh, significance and intricacies of human capital management. And that would be particularly true for Gen X and Gen Y, and, and what we're at risk at here is that conventional business leaders may be alienating an entire generation of, uh, of young Canadians. So that's, that's, the, that's the premise behind this conversation. Let me then go back up to the front and, and build my case on each of, of, of these for you. So message number one. Uh, mahogany Row, the traditional hierarchy of business is dead. And along with it, the idea that wisdom comes from depth of experience is wrong. It's not about the depth of experience. In today's world, it's about the width, the breadth, and the variety of a leader's experience. It's about the leader's experience repertoire. And so it's very likely that we're seeing the end of the era of the deep expert and the comeback of the generalists. In other words, if you're running a business it's, and you're looking down into your organization, it's not what your people know today that matters. It's really what they can learn going forward. So the shelf life of what anyone knows is, is decreasing. So rather than think about how deep a bank of knowledge you have in a narrow area, one needs to think about how you diversify that knowledge and how you broaden it. And of course, that's exactly why networks and connections and relationships matter. And it's why access to people and the insights that people provide becomes the key. It, it's simply a different world where everything you need to know or want to know is available 24 seven for free on the internet. The fact is that, that the, there's no, there's no premium anymore on knowledge as a standalone uh, entity. It's really about your ability to access what you need to know when you need to know it. And in that sense, 
leadership is a lot more like jazz than it is uh, classical music. Uh, classical music, while wonderful, you're, you're considered a great classical pianist if you play the music exactly the way Beethoven intended it to be played. Well, today's world isn't that clean and simple. Uh, today's world is very frenetic, uh, very fast-paced, very chaotic, very much more like a jazz club. And if anyone knows anything about jazz, the key to jazz is imagination, improvisation, and flow. And so the point here is the old hierarchical models of managing and leading are gone because the context has changed and because the context is more uh, like a jazz club, leaders need to be able to lead as a jazz musician would, imagination, improvisation, and flow. Message number two, on this theme of leadership being a scarce natural resource, the, the supply of great leaders is short. Uh, the demand is high, so we have a scarcity value. So there is a great market for great leaders. If you think about what a leader in this context that we live in today uh, is, uh, is all about, uh, the role of the leader is to ask questions, not to provide answers. And you don't have to go back very long ago when even into the 70s, certainly through the 50s and 60s, the leader was expected to have all the answers. Well, today, the really great leaders, the superstar leaders, are the ones that are able to ask the deep, penetrating questions. And so it's a Socratic style of leading and, and leading to get new answers to old questions and to get new questions that bring new answers. And the race, quite frankly, is on to uh, to see who is going to come up with these new answers and and it doesn't have to be a Steve Jobs it uh, it can be something like a Steve Jobs and 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 it's a way of thinking it's a way of leading it's a way of being uh a great framer of questions and unfortunately too many of our leaders today um are down in the weeds in their organizations when they should be up in the clouds. And if a leader in a business, and it doesn't matter whether it's a small business, a medium-sized business, or a, or a multinational, the questions that the leader should ask are about the opportunities. Uh, a, a company that is expanding its share of opportunities is a company that is destined to be more successful. Message number three, I want to come back on this concept of middle management. Middle management, the, the middle classes, is the heartland of, of organizational life. It's, it's where wealth is actually created. It's where innovation happens. Uh, innovation and wealth are not created on the executive floor, the corner office. They're, they're created by the middle managers. And a very good writer and, and, and business person, a fellow by the name of Art Kleiner, uh, phrased this as the core group. And what Art says is that in any organization, there's a core group. There's a group of influencers and deciders, the go-to people. And that regardless of what the org chart looks like, there's actually a second org chart that you could draw for any company. The fancy name for it is SNA, Social Network Architecture. But what it simply says is that in the body of the organization, there are some people who may not have title or tenure, but who have influence. And it's those people and what those people say and think and what they support that actually allows an organization to succeed or fail. And so, having an environment where this core group of influencers is able to uh, dialogue is, is, is key. The fourth message 
is, and building on the middle management theme is around followership. Uh, I'm pretty sure as of a day or two ago, if you had Googled business leadership, you get something like 766 million hits. If you Google the word followership, you get 484,000 hits. I think it tells us something about the overemphasis we've put on leadership, particularly on charismatic leadership, and that we haven't developed a very good understanding of followership. And it would be true that all great leaders, business politics, Canada, Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, all great leaders have one thing in common, willing followers. Leaders are not all charismatic, they're not all one thing or the other, but they have this ability to create willing followers. And so the question becomes, what is it that allows a leader to create a followership? And I believe the answer to that is credibility. Credibility is the currency that we use to measure the value of a leader. And the credibility of a leader is like a stock price. It goes up and down during the day, during a week, during a month, a quarter, a year, a career. And the bigger that pool of goodwill and credibility, the better a leader can lead. And you study credibility as the currency of leadership, you begin to understand very quickly that among all the determinants of leadership credibility, there are two that really stand out. Number one, the quality of decisions that the leader makes. And secondly, the quality of relationships that the leader has. If, if a leader has a brand, a personal brand, that is supported by a track record of great decisions and great relationships, that leader will have a huge bank account of goodwill, that credibility bank. And that bank is important because that's like the rainy day fund. That's the bank into which the leader might have to dip at a particularly difficult moment or time to make a very difficult decision. And if that bank account's not there, the followers will not be inclined to grant permission to the leader to lead. So those are, those are some of the things that are changing out there. Um, I think there's some things that, that business people can do about it, and that particularly young business people can do about it, because in this new world, leadership really has nothing to do with age or tenure. Uh, in fact, um, the fresh thinking uh, is needed more today than any other time. So we need to rethink some things. Let me give you my list. Uh, we need to rethink the type of leaders and leadership that we need. These times call for transformational leaders, not transactional leaders. The pressures, technology, social change, globalism, uh, demography, all of this means that we're in an exciting period of transformation. And therefore, we need leaders who are transformers, and not, not maintainers. And, and there's a set of leadership traits that go along with that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different type of leadership smarts. Uh, Howard Gardner has written extensively on the subject, the topic of multiple intelligence, and the fact that there's different ways to be smart. And he's right, and he's right that there are different ways to be smart in leadership given the external context. So I, I think there are a new set of competencies that we should be looking for in leaders. There's a new set of competencies that we should be testing for. There's a new set of competencies that we should be recruiting on. And uh, there's eight or nine of them, but I think for our talk tonight, I, I, I think there's three that, that to me are, uh, are critical. The first is the leader's CQ, their contextual intelligence. 
CQ is the ability to make sense out of craziness. It is situational understanding. It's an ability to, uh, to connect the dots. So contextual intelligence, the ability to look at the world and see all of the things that are happening and weave them together into a leadership story. The second competency is SQ, which is strategic intelligence. And so if CQ is sense making, SQ is sense shaping, and it's about how you take all of these uh, interrelated and yet on the surface disparate things that are happening and put them together into a package. And it's in the design of that package that you get business success. So it's not in the features, functions, and uh, uh, components of a product, of a service, but it's in the design, and particularly the design of the, of the experience, and that's all about senses and sense making and sense shaping. The third related competency for leaders, given the times in which we live, and, and I've now said that five or six times, and, and hopefully the point is being made that a leader leads within a situation or a context, and when the context changes, so much so must the leader's toolkit. So the third leadership competency, I believe for the next 10 to 20 years, is AQ, ambiguity intelligence, which is the ability to cope with uncertainty without freezing up. So the ability to live in the gray, the ability to suspend judgment, the ability to to be comfortable with not knowing, and yet so many old style leaders need to know everything and they, they have terrible AQ. Coming back with just a few words on, on human capital, and I mentioned that in the 1920s we we thought of employees as costs and we came into the 60s, 70s, 80s and all leaders gave the same speech. And the sadness is some of them are still giving it today and here's what they're saying as they address their employees. They say, our people are our greatest asset. Well, they're wrong. And there are, the use of the phrase and the metaphor is actually offensive. When you talk about people as your greatest asset, uh, you're not only implying that you own the asset, but we know that assets can depreciate. The modern way to think about employees is to think about them and treat them as investors. And the leader, therefore, the business leader, has a responsibility to create the climate or the culture within which people are allowed to do their best work. And if those conditions are created, the employee at any level will invest more of themselves, their intellect, their passion, their energy, they'll invest more of their discretionary investment in the company. And it's, it's by creating the right environment that you free people up to make the choice that they want to be more active and involved in, in the company. And there's a huge opportunity for business differentiation in this realm. In other words, it may even be true that the biggest source of competitive advantage inside a company is this ability to create a climate that allows people to want to give more of themselves. And that's where social network architecture is, uh, is, is pretty, uh, pretty key. So some ideas about what to do. Um, one idea would be to begin to change our habits 
in the field of organizational psychology, there's a, an old phrase about the fact that people acquire their bad habits in good times and their good habits in bad times. And when we look at Canadian business, things have been pretty good in Canada for a very long time. And so it shouldn't be that surprising that we've developed some bad habits. And until business people and academics and politicians want to have that adult conversation about changing the habits, uh, we're not going to be able to make much uh, progress. There are some very influential people in this country who agree that Canada is suffering from a dislocated shoulder, that we're suffering from a dislocated shoulder from having patted ourselves on the back too hard when in fact we need to be pretty darn sober about who we are and where we stand in the world and uh, and recognize that Canada's place as a as an international trading partner and international business headquarters uh, location is not what it was five years ago or ten years ago. The facts, whether they come from the World Bank or or other parts of international study were, were falling. The second big idea is on uh, transformational leaders and, and this is a real poke in the eye of convention to simply say that if we need transformational leaders then we need more rebels, we need more deviants, we need more outlandish, crazy, big bold thinkers and we need that because we've got to give ourselves a shot of adrenaline and, and we, can't, we can't maintain a nice tidy house in the midst of a chaotic world. We need, to, we need to understand the chaotic world and we have to meet the chaotic world on its own terms and, and therefore we need people that are comfortable in those crazy environments rather than in the starched white shirt kind of uh, businesses that, that we have and this is where new competencies come into play. The last big idea that I'll leave you with and then we'll move on to, to questions is I think we need some fresh Canadian thinking. I, I think that we're guilty in Canada of karaoke capitalism. We, uh, we practice a cheap imitation of uh, what's done elsewhere in the world. Um, in fact, it's almost likely like we have outsourced our business leadership thinking to the Americans rather than having confidence to develop leaders in a Canadian way that stand for Canadian values that, that are very marketable in the world. And yet the number of business leaders, the number of people talking about business leadership in Canada is, is not very good. Um, there's a international forum, www.thinkers50.com, www.thinkers50.com, that every year posts a roster of the top 50 thinkers in the world, 30 of which are American, six of which are British, six of which are from India, three are from Canada, uh, Roger Martin, Henry Mintzberg, and Don Tapscott, but we're not making the contribution that we should in the, in, the, in the area of leadership thinking. And I think if we took leadership and we wrapped it in the Canadian flag and leveraged the diversity of what Canada is and used our multicultural mosaic as, a, as part of the Canadian brand, that we'd be able to go out to the market, distinguish ourselves, um, do it in a way that's uniquely Canadian. And I think and I know that that brand called Canada is well received. And I think we've just got to be more self-assured uh, about going and, and getting markets. And I'm not talking about markets in the US. I'm not even talking about markets in the BRIC countries, Brazil, 
Russia, India, and China. It may be too late for Canada there. But there's a whole new exciting wave of countries like Croatia, Turkey, Mexico, Vietnam, that are wonderfully exciting markets for Canadians and where the Canadian flag would, would be well received. So I think it's a great time for a renaissance in Canadian leadership. It's a great time to be a business person and there's great opportunity provided that we go about it with a different mindset, uh, better reflecting the context in which, uh, in which we live. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Doug, do you see the question from Emmanuel? Where do you see Africa as a market for Canadian leadership? Yeah, I um, I think uh, Africa has some interesting possibilities. Um, uh, the obvious ones are in natural resources. Uh, I think that's almost too easy. Uh, for my uh, business in Africa, I think that what the African countries want, in addition to natural resource um, development, is all of the new technologies, all of the new thinking. I, I would tell you, I think there's a bigger opportunity for healthcare and education in Africa than for natural resources. So I think we just need to view Africa not as the old Africa, but the new Africa, and get away from, um, from natural resources is the only thing Canada and Africa have in common, and, and move on to some of these new things where Canadians actually have some wonderful expertise in remote healthcare and and uh, dietary stuff and education. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. Um, unfortunately, we're not in Africa the way we should be as businesses. And, and that's a, a good example of where we need to differentiate. Doug, I'm just gonna add a comment to that if I may. I was looking at uh, African manufacturing capability Southern African manufacturing capability a few years ago and realized that in fact, uh, predominantly in South Africa, but it's starting to spread is that uh, they have developed a, a completely capable manufacturing sector and can make just about anything that is required, say, by the households and other, and other business requirements. Maybe we could show some leadership by looking at uh, Southern Africa as a source for certain uh, raw materials and, and maybe finished goods instead of automatically looking to China. Yeah. I, I think, uh, Dave, that's exactly my point. I think, unfortunately, the BRIC countries, including China, everyone, the Europeans and the Americans, have been in there in a big way for the last 15 years. We haven't done that. And so I don't think it's good national economic policy to go there because I don't think we can compete. But if we pick our spots, and Africa would be a good one, um, I think we can get a disproportionate share of opportunity. Hey, Dave, I'm, I'll actually jump in here. A couple of people have uh, written in to the chat feature as opposed to the question and answer. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, and get to those. So, uh, so one of the students asked, a number of students in the Innovation Leadership MBA program here have the potential to be the new type of leaders you're advocating for in your book. However, many of the incumbent so-called business leaders are unwilling are unable to get past their complacency, making it nearly impossible to foster the much needed transformational form of leadership in this country. With that in mind, how and when do you see such barriers being broken down to stop the ongoing underutilization of such talent? Wow, great question. Uh, accurate analysis, well, for sure. Um, I think that um, the young generation in business um, has to consider a more entrepreneurial uh, entree into the market. Uh, in the old days, uh, young business people joined one of the big banks or one of the big insurance companies and you thought you could climb the ladder and you, you did that. Uh, so climbing the corporate ladder in a big company is not the way it's done anymore. Uh, there's a, a tremendous book out about navigating the lattice, so we've moved from from ladder to lattice, and so what I would recommend is 
is a young person uh, getting involved with small and medium-sized business, very entrepreneurial, and, and moving from company to company, from geography to geography, uh, taking a, a, Can a young Canadian entrepreneur and having them go to Ghana or having them go to Cambodia and, and go to where there is demand for what you have rather than being frustrated by trying to climb the ladder of corporate Canada. And nothing's going to change overnight, but there are some exciting entrepreneurial uh, companies. Interestingly, um, they tend not to be in the large cities. We know that uh, some of the best entrepreneurial companies come from smaller towns and remote regions, and so places like Atlantic Canada uh, are, are fertile places for, for businesses to start up. And, uh, and so I think you pick your geography, you, you pick a small and medium-sized company, you, prepared, you be prepared to move every couple of years to, to diversify your experience, go broad, and then even consider doing something overseas, which uh, is something that's incredibly valuable for anyone who's trying to build a business career, is to have that international experience. Okay, hey, perfect. Um, I guess, I guess, Dave. I'll just uh, there's a couple more here that I'll, I'll just uh, follow up on, and uh, if there's anything you'd like to add, Dave, just jump in there. Um, so another student uh, said, "I love your your uh, definition of employee as a stakeholder instead of an asset," uh, and they followed up with, "Any opportunity in the countries of uh, having Arabic Spring in the near future?" Yeah. Um, Another great question. Um, I, I spend a fair amount of time in the Middle East, um, much of it in Saudi Arabia and, uh, and in the UAE. Uh, we have a very large client based in Jeddah. And um, the CEO of that company is a graduate of MIT in Boston. Uh, the CEO of that Saudi Arabian headquartered company is on the board of MIT, and I can tell you that that company is uh, diversifying into um, all of those countries that we read in the news. They've made major acquisitions in Turkey, in Turkey Libya, um, Algeria, Morocco, and um, I think it's a good example of how in the midst of chaos there is opportunity. And while you might need a, a strong stomach, if you're a Westerner, to think about buying a business in Egypt right now, uh, economics would tell you that there's no better time to do it. And, and you have to overcome the short-term mentality that so many business people have and take a long-term view. And, and there's a particular company that, that, that we work with in, in the in KSA, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is, is able to take a long-term view. Also, with respect to Arab Spring and what's happening, um, we don't see the investment in social and community programs that are being made here. This, this company in Saudi Arabia has 20,000 employees in its community initiatives division. 20,000 employees of the company whose job it is to work on community initiatives in KSA. That is happening in other countries too. Uh, we, we, we don't, even though Canadians like to think they're open-minded, we, we, we're not that much better than the Americans in our misunderstanding of some of these places. So there's huge business opportunity in the Arab countries as there was in Eastern Europe. And those are countries that love Canadians and not to put us into competition with the Brits or the Yanks, I would say they like Canadians better than the Brits or the Yanks. Tremendous opportunity. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, and the last question I have here 
is, uh, Doug, can you let us know a little more about what you mean by ambiguity intelligence? Right. Thank you for the question. We have left-brained people and we have right-brained people. And the difference between the left brain and the right brain is huge. On the left brain, business leaders, they want analysis, proof, data, and science. And that's been the way that business has operated. There's been a bias towards left brain leadership. The right brain is the artistic brain. The right brain is comfortable with concepts and um, imagination, uh, art, and design. And if you accept that the world is not predictable, then left-brained emphasis is a bad investment in a right brain world because you're never going to be able to have enough facts in a timely enough fashion to give you 100% proof before you make a decision. So, so while the science of business decision making is interesting, it's really the art of business decision making that makes the difference. And so ambiguity intelligence is about being right-brained and not being paralyzed when you don't have all the information, to not be scared when you don't know the answer. It's, it's about living in suspended animation. And it really is no different than your mother told you when you were a kid and you were having a bad day and, and her advice when she tucked you into bed is, sleep on it, Johnny. Things will look different and better in the morning. And so this ability to live with not knowing, to live without jumping to conclusions, to live with a d higher degree of uncertainty is a healthier way to lead in a world that's full of uncertainty. And so ambiguity intelligence is the complexity of, of what it takes to be smart when you don't know, to be smart when you are unsure, and to not let that uh, cause you to shut down mentally. Doug, I'm gonna jump in with a comment on that, if I may. This is Dave. Mm -hmm. I I'd like to make an argument that uh, organizations, I think, always need a balance of both left and right brain leaders. I think there are parts of an organization that need to be run like a Swiss watch. And there are parts of an organization that, that are thinking outside the boundaries and are imagining. And I think that's one of the great challenges in innovation leadership. Uh, when you're at the top of an organization or even in the middle of an organization, understanding how much of this organization, what, what parts of this organization need to be run like a Swiss watch, where and how much and what parts of the organization need to be open at the edges. So it, I think that's really one of the biggest challenges we've got. Yeah, like everything else in life, it, uh, it's often a balance. Um, I think what happens and what concerns me is that in those switch a Swiss watch parts of the business, there is a hesitancy to change. And so the watch that we use today may need to be a different watch tomorrow, but hanging on um, to uh, an old model uh, is, not, is not the way to go. And so I often, even in those uh, important locked down parts of a business, uh, I think you have to be prepared to abandon at a regular rate. It's always struck me that, that we won't buy milk or a dozen eggs without, change, without checking the expiry date, and yet we'll put in an organizational process, and we don't put an expiry date on it, and it goes past its best before date, and then we, we're playing catch-up. I think that this actually 
uh, speaks to another issue. I see a question here on candor, and I, I really welcome that, that question. Um, there is no more important character trait of a leader than straight talk and candor. Jack Welch has made a speaking career out of talking on this, and he talks about the crime of superficial congeniality where we nod and smile, but we actually think something different. Passive aggressive behavior, biting your tongue, not being straight, not being candid is a character flaw. But in Canada, it's one of the habits, the bad habits that we've developed that we, we would rather seek compromise or consensus then push for a great idea. And if you know anything about decision making and behavioral decision economics, compromise and consensus by definition can never be better than the second best choice. They are the lowest common denominator. And when that becomes the default for a company or a leader, that every decision is made to achieve the lowest common denominator in pursuit of harmony, you basically prevent yourself from being great. And quoting Jim Collins on this, the enemy of great is good, and when good is good enough, you'll never be great. And so candor is the tool that must be used to open up the lens in order to push from great to good. Do we have any more questions for Doug tonight? That was it for the uh, chat chat box that came in uh, came in privately. Doug, I'd like to thank you. It's clear that you feel a very deep passion about the issue of Canadian leadership. That came through loud and clear. I'm very grateful that you're able to spend an hour of your evening, and many more hours than that before getting ready. I would like to thank you on behalf of the San Ramon School of Business for joining us uh, this evening. Pleasure. Thank you for uh, allowing me to have the chat. Excellent. We'll look forward to having you back in the future. Happy to do so. Thanks. Have a good evening.